extremely happy to be back for Bible study. We begin this study with the book of Luke. Luke. It's our first day, so we, we're not getting too much into it, but we are getting into the book. Book of Luke, Mark, Matthew, Mark, Luke. No, not John, Luke. That's where we're going. Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Very, very happy new year to everyone. And I know some of you, even though we didn't see you, for Bible study, we, we, you were with us throughout our services. And so we're so happy to, to have you again this evening. Luke's Gospel. The Gospel of Luke is the first of a two-volume historical book. It along with the book of Acts, and both of them are addressed to one person. His name is Theophilus. Theophilus, very likely, was a Roman Gentile official based on the title given to him in 1 verse 13, where Luke addresses him as Oh, excellent Theophilus. Um, there are several things that are unique about this book, and some of them we're going to talk about. But one of the first and the most unique thing is the author. Luke, the beloved physician, according to Colossians 4, verse 14. Luke is only mentioned two other times beside that in the entire scriptures. And even in his book, he's not mentioned by name. But we understand that he was the partner to Paul. He was imprisoned um, in Caesarea. And he was also there when Paul was beheaded. He was Paul's faithful companion. This young man, or this man called Luke, we understand that he was a physician. And it is displayed in his writings. He, he tends to highlight the healing. And he would describe in more detail um, the suffering that came as a result of that. But what is especially unique about Luke is that Luke is like you and I. Luke is the only Gentile author in all of the scriptures. Every other author in the scripture is Jewish. Luke is the only Gentile author in all of the scriptures. So when Luke writes, Luke's right, Luke writes from the perspective of a Gentile. You, you, you will find that Luke is not going to be discussing a lot of other things or emphasizing a lot of other things like that, that Matthew. Yeah, like the Old Testament scripture. Right, because he hardly ever quotes the Old Testament scripture in the book of Luke. But as much as it seems like that is a shortcoming to some people, that he, he doesn't um, quote the Old Testament scripture much, um, Luke is probably the most um, comprehensive Researcher. of the Gospels. He's the most comprehensive of the Gospels. He has miracles, at least six of them, that is not mentioned in any other Gospel book. He has 17 parables that he quotes that is not mentioned in any of the Gospels. But Luke was not a first-hand witness. Luke was not one of those who walked up the road every day with Jesus Christ. Luke was, well, he researched his information. And we see that in the book. And that highlights something else that we talk about when we talk about inspiration. That the scripture um, is inspired. We have talked about this through research. Here is the author of one of the most comprehensive books. As a matter of fact, Luke which is the longest book in the New Testament. Did anybody know that? Um, longest book in the New in, Testament. In, in terms of volume or in terms of how it was, um, how the chapter, because Matthew would be 28 chapters, Luke no, would no, be 24. Volume, oh, oh that, but, okay. Chapter, uh, okay, okay, yes, yes. Not only that, but um, 
Luke along with Acts would be equivalent of a quarter of the New Testament. Mm -hmm. Shocking, isn't it? Because Paul has written so many epistles, but here's Luke with two books, and he has written a quarter of the New Testament. Um, he has more than 40% of all that is written in the New Testament. More than 40%. So Luke, by his voluminous account, would have more writing than anyone else. Yes. Hang on one second. Let me bring in the mic to you. Yes. Luke, Luke was, was a, a physician. Yeah, he was a physician. Do you think because of his training, why he was so much, he was more detailed? No, I think Luke was more detailed because Luke was actually researching yes. um, to write to these guys. You know, the question is, why is Luke writing to uh, a, 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 a Roman Gentile? Gentile. Um, concerning Christ because Luke is now clearly from his writing um, a believer and is convinced of the truth of the Messiah of the Jews so Luke is researching carefully and accurately everything so that when he corresponds to these persons he will by the truths presented convince them of the truth of Jesus Christ so this is why right. Luke, Luke is bright. Um, the first, first, first four verses of Luke has the most um, accurate and um, perfect Greek in all of the New Testament. Um, you know, th those are things that, 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 that Luke, that, that, is, that is unique about Luke. Um, he doesn't write, doesn't use Hebrew terms a lot. And for the most times, he will give you the Greek equivalent. For example, Simon um, the Canaanian, um, in, in, in Matthew chapter 10, verse 4, that's how Simon is described. Luke calls him Simon the Zealot in 615. Um, he calls Golgotha, Calvary. And the Greek word he uses, it means the same thing, place of the skull. But because of who Luke's primary audience is, he writes to them in terms that they can understand. And so he doesn't go into, or he spends time to, to, to break out Jewish tradition so that people can understand what exactly is happening here. Um, he never uses the term rabbi for Jesus. He never uses the term rabbi. Throughout the book of Matthew, Jesus is addressed as rabbi consistently and constantly. Never does he use it. Instead, he uses the Greek word for Lord. You know, um, uh, he, he, uh, he does not trace the, te the genealogy of Christ through Abraham, which would be important to the Jew to demonstrate Messiah. He's not about demonstrating Messiah. He's about demonstrating Savior. He's about demonstrating Lord. He's about demonstrating the God-man. So Luke is not focused on trying to convince anybody this is the, the, the promised Messiah. Luke is more focused on telling us this is Jesus Christ, the promised one, the Son of God, God dwelling with us. That's who Luke is focused on the savior of all savior of, savior all of mankind and, 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 and Luke is also a very ex inclusive in, 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 in his writings and who he addresses you see he brings everybody so he traces not from Abraham but from Adam, Adam. you know as by one man sin entered the world and then by sin to all men even so the second Adam shall and he traces Jesus from Adam. No. There is a I don't even know we should deal with this now or later. But I might not remember later. Um, there is an argument that some people will bring to say that throughout the New Testament no, um, throughout the New Testament 
um, it, is, it is not pushed on the virgin birth. Um, I saw that. Somebody was discussing that. So I tell you, be careful of some of these um, commentaries that you read. Uh, but though he argues for it, he's saying that the Bible doesn't stress it. Of course it does. Of course it does. Beginning in Genesis chapter 3, it is essential that he be born of a woman. And why is it again? The what? Sin nature. So that he would not have the sin nature because you inherit the sin nature from the father. So people like Howard pass on sin nature. You know? Um, but, 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 but Jesus could not have been born of a man or else he would need to be saved himself. So the virgin birth is an imperative to our theology. It is imperative to the truth of scripture. It is imperative concerning Christ. It is just not something we skate around. And we do not value, in, value it in light of Catholicism. We value it for its theological significance. That's why it is irrelevant that Mary was no longer a virgin after she gave birth. It is irrelevant. Mary wasn't saving anybody. See? But Jesus was. So it was imperative that Jesus be born to someone who had not known a man and was not born by a natural father. See? So that, let, let's just get that out of the way because we're going to come back upon it again. Um, he highlights women in his, his book, which the Jews wouldn't highlight so much, even though Matthew takes a very unique um, approach yes. to the genealogy when he mentions at least three four. or four women well, inside of it. He mentioned three by name and one by implication. Right. Yes. So that's important. Um, uh, he, he traces or he gives the story of the narrative of the birth of Christ from Mary's viewpoint. From Mary's viewpoint. Um, he highlights Elizabeth. He highlights Anna, the widow of Nain. He highlights woman who anointed the feet of Jesus. He brings out more about Mary, Martha, and Mary Magdalene. Luke gives women um, a strong voice. Strong voice. Because he is not coming from the tradition of the, the Jewish people, as a matter of fact. As a matter of fact, in Acts 1.19... In Acts 1, 19. In Acts 1, 19. You should read Get it. Get the hint? Yes. Somebody <laughs> read it. Acts 1, 19 states, Everyone in Jerusalem heard about this, so they called that feel in their language, Akeldama, that is, feel of blood. Okay, so you will rock through that and don't even notice what Luke just did. He said they called that feel what? Akeldama. How did they call it that? Oh, uh, he said it, he said it. In their, their, own, in their language, language yes. Cry. Give the lady a star and send her to the head of the class. In their own language. So he makes the distinction that he's not Jewish. And doesn't speak the Jewish language. See? You have to be, you have to be very cognizant of all these yes. writers, right? It's because they give you some big hints, right? In the book, in the book, um, there are three great hymns of the church. All have has to do with the, the birth narrative. There is the magnificat. You know, I thought I would play some of this for you on a YouTube thing, but you going to get bored stiff with them because they are old hymns. But nonetheless, they are great hymns of the church. And great churches still put on these in concerts um, up to today. The Magnificat is found in 146 to 56. 
And then the Benedictus in 168 to 79. And then there is the New Dementis in chapter 2, 29 to 32. If you look up these and go online, you can play these back and hear the greatness of these hymns that, that men put scripture to music. And it became a big part of the early church. And it's still a part of the churches today. Um, he's a meticulous historian. Very detailed. And his detail helps us to have um, accuracy, especially with date. Turn with me to chapter 3. You with chapter 3? Yes. Luke right. 3. And we are at verse 1. Read verse 1 and familiar, please. In the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod Tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip Tetrarch of Ituria, and Chaconitis, and, and Licinius, uh, Tetrarch, sorry, of Abilene. Okay. Now, you read that. And you say, well, all this information, what purpose it serve? It is, it is information that helps us to tie down dates. You can accurately trace the date of what is happening here. He's about to talk about the, the, the baptism of, the, of Jesus Christ. And you can trace down the date as to when John came on the scene. When did John came? He gave us six clues in that one verse. First clue, in the 15th year of the reign of um, Tiberius Caesar. Tiberius Caesar is an historical figure. And the history books have the years that he reigned. So all you would need to do is trace back his 15th year and you would have the exact time that this is happening. Pontius Pilate was governor of Judah. That confirms again time, you know. Herod was a tetrarch of Galilee, again. And his brother Philip was tetrarch in the region of Ituria. And Licinius was tetrarch in Abilene. He gives us six clear clues as to date. I know it don't mean too much to you guys. I mean, you just read through. But when you're going to school and you're studying Bible, those things are imperative because you're going to have to argue some things. And those are things that theologians and Bible scholars use to prove the historicity of the book. It's not something that is made up. It's not a good Bible, um, bedtime story. This is not Uncle Arthur's bedtime story. This is the Bible. It's a living, breathing thing where with actual historical events that took place. It's not something that made up. So here Luke writes. And he gives us that kind of things. Constantly throughout the book, you're going to find um, him writing like that. Um, again, the theme of Luke's book is Christ, the Son of Man, And he uses a distinctive approach to prove that. So, that's Luke. Any questions with Luke so much? I told you he's mentioned three times in scripture. And, and not much is said about him. Because Luke did not, it was not a focus on himself. Luke was not trying to lift up himself. Luke was trying to lift up the Lord. So um, Colossians 4 verse 14 is where you mention, is mentioned. 2 Timothy 4, 11. Philemon 24.
So, there begins the background of the book of Luke. Um, as I said before, too, Luke is more detailed. So, when you read the other narratives, the other gospels, uh, even John, um, even though John is not... Is, is not um, Synoptic. Uh, Luke gives us a lot of supplemental information that fills out the story for us. It does. So it is a fantastic book. I would encourage you to read ahead. And as you read ahead and we encounter the scriptures each week, it will bring better understanding to you. So again, let's begin our journey through the book of Luke. Beginning in chapter 1. Verses 1 through 4. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Oh, it's the NIV. NASB and the My My apologies. Let me change it over here. Since many have undertaken to compile, yes. Oh, these these people with them phone Bible. I know that's the latest NSB. Go ahead, read. It don't matter. Okay. Same thing. Yeah. Since many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as they were handed down to us by those who, from the beginning, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word, it seems. It seemed fitting to me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write it out for you in an orderly sequence, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know that sorry, so that you may know the exact truth about the thing you have been taught. Okay. So then there's an indication there that Theophilus is aware of whom. Jesus is. There is an indication there that Theophilus is not a blank state. state. That information is now being poured into. This is a confirmation of the things that Theophilus has heard. So his effort is to affirm the things that Theophilus has heard and to confirm the truth of it. So he says, in as much as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us. What are the things accomplished amongst us? And you can discuss, you know. Um, I think it's in regards to Jesus. Of course. Uh, yes. It's in regards to to the work of Christ. Notice what he calls it. The things accomplished amongst us. What would that be? Tell me some of the accomplishments of Christ. The various miracles, his death, his burial. Oh, is oh, sorry. Oh. Tell me some of them. <laughs> Is death and resurrection which has brought us salvation? Biggest accomplishment. His birth, fulfilling what the gospel has mentioned years before. Yes, not the gospel mentioned it, but the scriptures has mentioned years before. Yes, is that important? Why? Hmm? Why is that important? God is true to his word. Well, that God keeps his word. You know, there's a passage that begins that, um, that says, and in the fullness of time, God sent forth Galatians. his son. Galatians. Yes, which is indicative that Jesus didn't come one day because his spaceship crashed. <laughs> you know. He didn't land on earth because he was flying somewhere. The, 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 the spaceship crashed. 
and him decide to hang out. No, it was a deliberate act, his birth. And it was also a deliberate what? Plan of God. I hear somebody say plan over there. Who? Oh, okay. Deliberate plan of God. She was going to get her now. I'm not getting it again. But anyway, a <laughs> deliberate plan of God. You know, it was the purpose of God to bring him. How oh, is that the purpose of God? Because God declares that before the foundation of the earth, what happened? Yes. Christ died for us. So now, how is Christ dying for us? We start out with Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve falls into sin. And that looked like the plan crashed. But did it? No. Genesis chapter 3 tells us that God had purpose and plan. Even in that, remember? He says that the seed of the woman a direct reference to Jesus Christ. And we have discussed this many times. Why is, it, why is it a reference to Jesus Christ? Because he's the only seed of a woman. Women don't carry seed. Women don't give birth without men. Even by artificial insemination, you don't give birth without men. See? So the seed of the woman was a promise to come. And throughout the book of Genesis, what we see happening is God's plan um, being developed to bring him. It begins with a man called Abraham. Right? And from that man called Abraham, God is going to bring forth a race. Mm -hmm. That man in Genesis, um, in Genesis, um, towards the end, is it 40? Um, there is a prophecy concerning, um, that it, well, it's before that. It's, it is a covenant where he says, um, through Abraham, all the nations shall be blessed. You see? Yes, it's Genesis 12. Um, through Abraham, then it, now here is Abraham. You just pick up Abraham in a story. And the story you read tells you Abraham must go to this place because God wants him there. And you are not tying it in with God's purpose. But God's purpose is to raise up a people. God's purpose is not only to raise up a people, but to raise up a people in a certain land. Yes, Genesis 12 verse 3. Um, to raise up a, a people in a certain land, to raise up a people in, by a certain, a certain nationality. So he calls Abraham, and he sends Abraham, and you read all the story of Abraham, and you read about the sons of Abraham, and then you get to the place where um, Abraham, um, one of Abraham's sons had, our grandson, had 12 boys. Yes, Jacob, who would later on be called what? Israel. Israel, who the nation would be named after. And you see God working out his plan. And then you get to chapter 40, thereabouts. And the 12 boys are gathered by their father's bed. He's dying. So that part of the story now is coming to an end. It's almost like a sequel, like a soap opera. And you're not connecting the dots. And in that, suddenly, get that, that he's doing what he does as a Jew, passing on the blessing, and he's trying to rig it in a way that his favorites get the blessing. Did you notice that? He's blessing Joseph two boys. Because if he blesses Joseph two boys, there can't be no argument. It's him two sons, not Joseph. But that gives Joseph a double portion of blessing. See? And here we see Joseph rising to prominence. Mm -hmm. Prominence, the one whom they tried to kill. And he declares, you didn't mean to kill me off, but God meant it for a good. You remember that? What good did God mean it for? Because I hear people quote those passages all the time. His purpose. His purpose. That was the good. That God, through their actions, was going to fulfill his purpose. So God fulfilled the purpose. And what was the purpose? To raise up Joseph to be a governor in Egypt. Why? All of that's important. Because then Israel and his sons, when go down to Egypt, go cool out. 
Why? Because there is famine. Yes, they went to cool out. They weren't there forever. Because, because God called them to the promised land. This is not the promised land. But God sends them there again for purpose. Uh, that was prophesied more than the prophesied with them. It prophecy where it affected Jesus. Out of Egypt have I called my son. It's warm in here. Yes, no fans are on. Don't know why. No, it's warm in here. You're not in the light. I am in the light. <laughs> no, you're supposed to be the light. That's in it. <laughs> but, but I am the light and in it. <laughs> and it's warm. So, you know, I don't know why people argue, you know. And them don't have light shining on them. <laughs> you know. So, so here it is that God in his purpose is calling Israel out. But even before we get there, in the blessing, in the blessing, look what happens in the blessing. One son who nobody to talk about. Judah. Judah was a scoundrel and a trickster. Trick off the woman to fall down and tell her lie. Who do that lady would later on come again to be mentioned in the genealogy of Jesus Christ? Remember who that lady was? Don't say anything. You know who that lady was? Tamar. Tamar. Yeah, you guys doing much better than I thought. Uh, yes, that is an encouraging thing for the year. You don't do this well the next year after we have, next week after we have Bible study normally. Tamar is mentioned in a story, and you wonder what we're all in this story for. Yes, but then here it is that Tamar is featured later on in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, and Judah is extremely important. Why is Judah important? Because the son is not only going to be the son of Abraham, is not only going to be blessing all the nations, but he will come from the direct lineage of Judah. Yes, the scepter will not depart. Judah is the lion's well. What will lion come from? All of a sudden, lion in the story. Judah is the lion's wealth, and the scepter will not depart from him. So there you see God's plan from then coming into being, and thousands of years later is now reality. And Luke is picking up on that reality because the background would have already been available to most persons. And Luke is saying, hey guys, this is the genuine thing. He is the real McCoy. This is no book up business here. You know, it's not by accident. Luke brings it out. He says, all these things that he has accomplished amongst us. So what has been accomplished amongst us? The works of God. The works of Jesus Christ. They have now been accomplished. I know we know that. Because Luke knows. Because he's done the research. Words of Jesus on the cross. It is finished. It's accomplished. It's done. See? So all of this was accomplished amongst us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses. Now who are those from the beginning? And which beginning is he talking about? He's talking about the beginning of John. That's where it starts from. John was the forerunner. That's where his story is about to be launched from. It couldn't be the beginning of creation. There's nobody there. So which beginning is he talking about? And he's talking about the specific time in the history of Christ's coming. It was handed down 
to us who were there. And they were what? Eyewitnesses. Now why does he say that? From you two at the front, tell me how important the eyewitness is. Give them the mic. We can't waste so much money send them to school for so much years to the law and then can't tell us the importance of the eyewitness. How are you going to have to pay us back the money? Oh, okay, well, an eyewitness would speak to the credibility of the story. Of course. <laughs> the credibility of the story. Not only are they credible witnesses because they have seen, he's telling you something that makes them even more credible. What is that? Servants of the word. So there is also a character issue that comes into play. We have eyewitnesses, you know, sometimes. But they're not credible. But he's telling us that these guys not only saw, these guys have integrity. Servants of the word. It seemed fitting for me as well. Why? Because I am telling you this self, fellas. And I am not just telling you off at the top of my head. I want you to understand that the source that I have researched this from is an authentic, reliable, dependable Credible. source. Just let me put it on another word. Credible. Credible. Yeah, well, all I mean is the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> Source. Yes. This is not no Nancy story that we gathered one evening and our parents told us. You know? This is facts. And he says, like many persons have gone ahead and written about these facts. So listen, I have determined to write to you. And he's not writing only to Theophilus. But he's by extension writing to every Gentile. So that we might be convinced by the truth of the word. Not convinced by how we feel. Not convinced by something dropping in with spirit but convinced by the truth of the word. And that's the point Luke is making. Servants of the word, truth of the word, dependable men who walk in integrity. They um, are bringing these to you. So he says, um, it's fitting for me to write from the beginning, to write it out for you. Not just write it, but write it out, to tell you the story, to tell you everything that is going on. Write it out in detail so you can read it. It is not coming to Theophilus by word of mouth. Yes. And that does not discredit um, um, the tradition of the oral tradition. But he's writing it because if he's researching it, it has to be told or it has to be written somewhere else too. So he's writing it out to ensure that the truth is being communicated. So it's written. Is that important? I better believe it's written. It's important. Why did Jesus kept saying, it is written? It is written. It is written. It is written. Because the written word carries with it. That assurance that you can always go back to. When in oral tradition, you say something, and I don't catch it good, and I come back and I say, bet you did say something, bet you no, that's not what I said. Bet we have to call witness no, because the twelve was in argument as to what bet said. But when it is written, there's no need for an argument. 
right? It's one of the reasons why they went to school again, you know, with good money. Um, why? So that they might demonstrate it in writing. Something's lawyers always tell you, get it in writing. Mm -hmm. Because it cannot be argued. So here he is, he's getting the truth. And he's doing it for one purpose. He's writing to Theophilus, who we think is a, a, a Roman um, dignitary, dignitary mm -hmm. an executive of some sort. Because even in today's language, the only person we, we style as excellent, people like the Governor General, the Prime Minister, and other persons in that category. So Theophilus was just no hard little man on the corner. You understand? Him not writing him, brethren, on the corner was sit down. But we hear from, we hear, we hear from Luke, like, hey, hey, what Luke has said. No, 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 no. Theophilus is a dignitary, and it demands that Luke's response meets that kind of credibility. See? So Luke writes. By the way, Theophilus means friend of God. Friend of God. We don't know anything about Theophilus. More than what it says, that he was His Excellency. Nothing we know about Theophilus. Why we don't know more about Theophilus? For the same reason we don't know why, what Jesus was writing in the dirt when the woman was caught in adultery. It is the Aramaic. What is it again? That's right. None of your business. The thing is not about Theophilus. It's about Christ. It's about Christ. So that you may know what? The, the, the exact, exact truth. truth. Affirmation of what? Inerrancy. Mm -hmm. Affirmation that the Bible doesn't have mistakes. So that you may know the exact truth. So Luke not hiding anything. He's not going to put you up anything and dress it and call it something else. Yes. He's giving Theophilus the truth. What I like about Hang on. Anything from the people? Yes. What I like about it is that he didn't just say, I'm giving you an account. He's giving you an orderly account. So well, nothing is missed. Yes. Right? Um, yeah. It's, 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 it's consecutive order. And what that means, he's telling you as it happens. So him don't say, well, you know, um, them just come and come crash, right? And so he says, he's telling the story. He says, well, listen, this morning she get up, you know, and she drink a cup of tea. You know, Jamaicans tell the story. She drink a cup of tea before she leave. And her mother asked her, you know, you don't want some porridge? And she said, no, I can't stop. It's an accident. I'm talking about it now. She said, no, I can't stop. So she leave her mother's house, barely drink the cup of tea, and, you know, she never even drink much of the tea, you know, even though it was Milo. You know? And she go on, and then she go pick up her friend, and the two of them going on the road and decide to stop at um, McDonald's and go get her breakfast. Before she didn't eat her mother's breakfast, this would not happen, you know. Because it's true, she stop at McDonald's now. Them coming down the stoplight, the man jam in front of them, and then boop, hit the brake and the thing spill. Burn her up and she let go the steering wheel. So the accident, huh? <laughs> you see how you got that story of the accident? Well, that's what Luke's doing. He's bringing in everything. He's giving you the full picture. So that when it finishes, you don't have no question to ask. And somebody said to you, well, it's what I'm right so. Well, this morning, are you not I mean, you know? But because of all Luke, this morning, you know, she gets up and her mother tell her, I said, boy, have a cup of tea. And she rushed. I said, you was there? No, but my brethren just tell me. <laughs> you know, this is Luke. He's telling you a story and he paints a complete picture. He's leaving out nothing. He's giving you the exact, which is measured truth. 
measured to its fullness. We don't start yet, you know, just telling what Luke do. As it's all Luke do in the first three verses. And he, he, he addresses it by saying, I. So he speaks in the first person. Mm -hmm. So when he does that, guess what Luke is doing? Putting his own credibility online. Putting his own credibility online. When I don't, sure, I'm not telling you I. No, no, I'm telling you, say, how I'd say. <laughs> So if you have any questions about it later on, well, if I tell it says, how oh, I tell me, you know, so come talk to all about it. Luke puts his credibility on the line by saying, I. You're saying something? Mike, Mike, Mike. No, because you said he puts his credibility on the line, so I'm asking, wasn't he there? Who, Luke? Yeah. You come late. You see how you give for yourself there now? That question tell me say you reach late. Because we said long time, Luke was not an eyewitness. And it says so in the passage too. But things that he had researched. Yes, investigated. Yes, this is, this is a result of his investigation. You just come give it the elder now. In fact, I'm sneaking late and I never noticed. <laughs> no, no, Mas Donald, you see why the Bible says, let them ask their husbands at home. <laughs> All right, so he begins his story, and he gives us the historical backing for his story immediately, the historical background. He says, in the days of Herod, king of Judah. Judea. Judea. In the days of Herod. So immediately you know the years that he's talking about, the span of time. Then he gives us something else that can be traced. He said, there was a priest named Zacharias. And because there is a listing of the service of these priests, they could tell exactly where the priest was serving from. See? They could tell. Now, we know two things so far. That Herod was the king, mm -hmm. and there was a priest named Zacharias. Zacharias. After the division of understanding. You have to understand that Zacharias is not the only priest. So don't jump up and say he was the high priest. He was a priest. If we understand how the priests worked, we would understand that every de descendant of Aaron was automatically a priest. Every male descendant of Aaron was automatically a priest, right? So if you're counting all these years from they left Egypt till now, you're going to find that there are going to be what? Thousands of priests. Aaron. Mm -hmm. They are from the tribe of Levi, but they are from Aaron, direct descendants of Aaron. All right? Um, every one of them was automatically a priest. All right? So, there were too many, so what they did was divide up the work. If they didn't divide up the work, some people wouldn't get a chance to do a thing. See? Because they're divided into sections. And there are 29 sections. And only certain occasions did they all work, like like the um, like 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 the, the Passover, um, Pentecost, the Feast of Tabernacles. That's the only time they all got a little opportunity to serve. to serve. Why? Because people came out. Remember in Pentecost, how many people were in Pentecost again? That, well, we, can't, we don't know the exact number, but we know how many got saved. Over 3,000. So if over 3,000 got saved, then the place must have been flooded with persons. Yes. So because these are feasts that Jews are required to come back to, 
It means that the place would be flooded and that the priests would be most busy at that time. So, here we are going to see that he's serving. For him to serve, they would actually cast lots to see who get the local work to do. Who got, who got this to do? So anyway, we don't reach there so yet. We just know um, that he was there. All it tells is that there was a priest named Zacharias. He had a wife from the daughters of Aaron. Now, um, and her name was Elizabeth. Elizabeth. And it means my God is an oath. Elizabeth. So, two things we know so far. Everyone was raining. Mm -hmm. Zachariah, Zachariah was a priest. priest. Mm -hmm. And Zachariah was married to a woman named Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Who also was born from Aaron. No, priests were required to get married to virgins. And that was in keeping with the reputation that they needed to uphold. But here, he's not only married to one, he's married to one who is from the priestly tribe. That's all we know so far. They were both righteous in the sight of God. What does that mean? Right. As it, 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 uh, the text actually states that they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly. No, no, talking about righteous. Right. Yes. Say about righteous. <laughs> Him realizing that man is righteous, him down to the other world now. <laughs> Come now. It's a man behind you. They were pleasing to God. They were what? Pleasing. Well, everything they do were pleasing. But what made them pleasing and what caused them to be righteous? The lineage from which they come? Can't be. You know. Can't be. Nobody's born righteous. What is the setting here? Is this Old Testament Old or New Testament? Old Testament. Old Testament. Old Testament. Yes. So they obey what, the laws. What would be the qualification to make somebody righteous in the Old Testament? Give you a hint. What you said? I begin no? to the law? No. The law. Can they can't manage to keep the law either. The, the Romans is very clear in the New Testament that nobody could manage the law. Obedience to God? Well, um, I'm thinking about a passage in the New Testament where they were talking about Moses and all of the people who had gone before and they're saying that their righteousness didn't come from their works either, but, but that God imputed righteousness unto them. Yeah, but why would God impute righteousness to these guys? Because I guess they believed in the pro promise of a savior that would come. No, they're, they're not looking so far though. They do not understand it sometimes, yes. What? Faithful. Faithful. Full. Yeah. No, you change the word. No. You just take off the phone. No, you can't tell them to take off anything. <laughs> you, you didn't put anything on. <laughs> Abraham believed believe God, God and it was what? Counted to him as righteousness. So they're righteous. Please. <laughs> Nobody said it. So their righteousness would be measured in terms of what? Their faith. Their faith. Faith. That's why fool change your word. <laughs> if you had just stopped at faith, you would have had it. Um, that's, what I was, that's what I was saying, what the text did. And no, 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 no. no. next life, you have to say. <laughs> but that's not what you said. They, they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly. I said righteous. We don't reach blameless now. No. How they walked is different than righteousness that is imputed to them. Righteousness is given to them because of faith. In the same manner, because Abraham believed God, God declared him as righteous. You know, some of you struggle with David. Abraham when God God's says of David that he's a man after my own heart, and you say, David did bad like what? What God to talk about? Because David was also a man of faith. 
and his faith please God greatly. And God impute righteousness to him. We are saved by faith. Righteousness comes to us on account of faith. Not because of works, lest any man should boast. So when you touch, walk. Sir, when you touch, walk and please God, it would mean that is by their actions they were doing it. Not so. We are saved by grace through faith. Abraham, it was given to him because he believed God. Hebrews was made, Abraham perfect? The man said him wife two times. I think Hebrews made it clear to him. Yeah. The, uh, the Hebrew, no, the, to oh, sorry. I, I think the book of Hebrews may, made it clear as well when it said, without faith, it is impossible to please God. To please God. Yeah. So any way you're going to be righteous is so, must true so faith. So it has to be a faith thing. Because it is by faith we believe God and accept him. Yes. It is by faith that we accept his word as truth. It is by faith that we receive the standards that he has given and look to walk. Faith results in something, which is what James tells us, which is the next line that comes, which is what? They walk blameless. Faith must manifest itself in how we walk, live, then for the word walk. So in other words, these two had faith in God and their faith caused them to be what? Blameless. What blameless mean? To walk. Right. right. You know, but you're going back to the same thing, you know? No. To walk in obedience. That's right. Blameless means without fault. Yeah. So it meant that they walked in obedience. To what? To God. Whatever God commands. Okay. Yes, but it was that that caused them to be righteous. They were righteous on account of their faith. Their faith resulted in a blameless walk. It's the same thing with us as Christians. See? But none of us walk around and tell everybody about them have faith. Them have faith. Them have faith. Them have faith. But your walk does not demonstrate that. And that's what James says. James says, I'm going to tell me anything. Show me. Because your faith must be revealed in how you live. And this is the same thing here. Their faith, which led them to fear, and fear meaning reverence God, caused them to walk in a way that it pleased God. They were blameless. See? in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord, which means that they were obedient. Theology of Scripture don't really change, you know. Old Testament, New Testament. God offered us something for you. See? And then the writer after all of that build up interjects something he says but they had no child what so that come into the story now something else you know why did they have no child why is that important is that important in the culture of the time it was in the culture of the time, a barren woman would be almost considered a woman who was living in sin. Yes, sin. Because she must have done something while God closed her womb. Is the assumption that they're going to make. So the writer circumvents that assumption by saying to you that they were righteous and they were without fault because they obeyed God. So they don't come to barren. See, it's a question you ask. Then the oh God make this happen and they obey him. Because obedience to God is not a guarantee of getting what you want. Is putting you in his purpose. 
is putting you in his place. I want you to understand and not undermine the importance of obedience to God. I want you to understand and not undermine the importance of obedience to God. Because when these lessons come, you know, you know what we love to do? We like to sidetrack, step around it and move to the next place. Why? It's too convincing. Victim. You know? <laughs> you know it's the worst part? I don't know why plenty of people think I have anything to do with writing of this. Because then every time I talk about obedience, somebody says, boy, I'll say you preach against me this morning. <laughs> I want to assure you, I do not know Luke. I did not advise him what to put in the scriptures. I didn't, God did not consult me as to the standards that he must have. I am coming upon it just like you, and it applies to me in the very same way it applies to you. Obedience is required as a demonstration of faith. If you are not walking in obedience, you are not demonstrating your faith. Nor are you exercising righteousness. So, she was barren. In other words, Elizabeth didn't have a child because she couldn't do anything about having a child. Mm -hmm. In the culture of the time, Elizabeth would have had, this would have been tragic for both of them. He had a wife who was childless. You know, things haven't changed all that much, you know. We go around and we're talking about them days and all of that and all of that. In today's generation, why do you think our young girls get pregnant so early? Why do you think our young men get them pregnant so early? Because they're trying to prove a thing. For some people, it's the mark of money. Yes, for a lot of the boys. Boy, you're not getting a youth yet. Why are you doing a weird part? You're fire blank. I'm telling you the truth. And, and this is why our Christian women come under such severe um, pressure. pressure. Self-induced. Because, boy, look at the time. Which time? You know what time it is? No. Quarter past. No. What time is it? I'm 24. Yes. Oh, that is time now? Yes. Time going on. I need to have a baby. And very often end up Doing what is wrong because. So there is the same intensity. There is the same feel of lack. There is the same feel that not being fulfilled. Not measuring up to womanhood. Same thing. And I know, not because I'm a woman. I know because I speak to the women who don't have children. I've had to talk to many, many Christian women who go through this ordeal every year, especially when it comes to Mother's Day. See? Same ordeal. So this is a tragic situation. He and his wife were childless. No. Look at Abraham's wife, if you don't believe me, to the extreme of the tragedy that is occurring. When Abraham's wife got to 90, and God reminds them to go have a baby, she convinced Abraham, said, not, not going to go, but you are a man and you need a child. So guess what you tell him to do? Go sleep with a helper. Make sure he give you a baby. A 
And what did Abraham do? Abraham remembered that he was a man of faith and he remembered God promised him a child and he remembered that in order for him to continue to demonstrate his righteousness, he must walk in obedience and trust God that God is going to give him a child to his wife. So Abraham turned to his wife and said to her, I rebuke you. I will not do what is wrong. No. Abraham saw it as an opportunity. What you are missing in the story is that Abraham had that same longing for a child too. So you jump up and you're ready to criticize Mass Abraham. The man is a hundred. From him young God telling him we have more children than the stars and the, 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 the sun. And, and him is now a hundred and him don't have none. And his wife give him permission. Go on to the lady and have one because it's most of God need. And she reasons with him. <laughs> you know, almost every time we reason what God said, we end up in trouble. Same say, even reason with Satan and get ourselves in trouble. She reasons with him and he compromises the standard of God's word. And he goes out and he gets a woman pregnant. And they still suffer as a result of that. Understand. The culture of the time is not any different from now. Jewish rabbis said this. Seven people were excommunicated from God. Seven. Who said it? Jewish rabbis. Who is a Jewish rabbi? Teacher. A religious, a religious teacher. teacher. Not just a teacher, it's a mm -hmm. religious teacher. Yes. Teaching the word. He's teaching this. They said that seven people were excommunicated from God. And you know what is the first thing on the list? A Jew who has no wife. And if you know what is the second thing, you'll understand why that one was the first. Because the next one was a Jew who had no children. They taught that them not having children is because God rejected them. Not having children was grounds for divorce. Hello? Was grounds for divorce. So before you jump up on Zachariah, understand the weight of what was happening with him. No, no, is that correct? We're reading both. So, the picture doesn't get any better. Because the next line says that they were both advanced in years. What is the author doing? He is painting the hopelessness of the situation. It was the same hopelessness that, that, that Sarah felt. Mm -hmm. I said Sarah, not Sarah. It's the same, and I just said to make the distinction. It's the same <laughs> hopelessness that she felt. It was the same hopelessness that Abraham felt that caused him to do what he did. So the author is saying, when they walked with God, but this was a blight that they had to put up with. But guess what? They continued to walk with God. Did you notice that? Yes. It didn't change their obedience. It didn't affect their commitment. You just want to book your tour and you now come to church tomorrow. Now come to church. Oh, you see that? You got name. And you now come to church tomorrow. Why? Because why? Deal with God and 
you know, done. God not here. Look how God met the woman like me on my side doing. Mm -hmm. And six weeks you don't see her come church. You mix with God. Why? Him, him don't do what I ask him to. They continued to walk with God. Don't miss it. Don't miss it. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God, in the appointed order of his division, so in his division, remember I said there are about a thousand persons in each division, he's given a task to do. He goes into the inner um, court, the temple, the, the court of the priests, and he offers up um, a fragrance offering. And on the outside, over on the other court, you're going to have the Israelites, it's called the court of Israel. Between the two courts, you're going to have a rail. So after he has offered up the incense, it would be considered a thing of joy, even privilege, for him to come out and greet the people and offer a blessing upon them. So the people would gather by the rail because they are expecting the priest to come out and bless them. See, why well, I'm telling you all of that because of what he said right after next. See? And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. The whole what? Multitude. What does that mean? The place full. By the way, tonight is a good show enough here for Bible study. Very good show. I hope you keep it up. The place ran. You know, place cock, nobody can enter. Full. They were there in prayer. Why? Because of the offering that was being offered on their behalf. And whilst they were outside, an angel of the Lord appeared to him. Word angel means messenger. This is one of those winged creatures that we talk about. But angels don't have body. They are spirit beings. We have said that. The Bible is very clear on that. So how am I seen? Because they are allowed in times to materialize. Yes, that means them take unto themselves a body so that they can be seen. This is one of two angels mentioned in the Bible by name. There are thousands of angels. The Bible says he could have called what? Ten thousand. Yes. And ten thousand don't mean him going cold and then say, all right, stop when you reach ten thousand here. Send those. No. It meant that there were just thousands and thousands and thousands of them. Right? Demons are fallen angels. Remember how many was in one man? Legion. But two mentioned in the scripture by name. This is one of them. So, an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right of the altar of incense. Now you see how precise the man is? He never just said an angel of the Lord appeared unto him. Tells you where the angel stood. See that? To the right of where the incense would be. And Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel. And fear gripped him. <laughs> In other words, it nearly dropped down. In our parlance. Trouble. The man nearly dead. See? And he was fearful. And the angel said to him, Do not be afraid. You notice every time he appears, he says that. Don't be afraid. He would have to send me that by WhatsApp. <laughs> Can you imagine me locked up in this place by myself? 
Nobody can come over here. And I am lighting something, and then boof, somebody stand up right here, so. I am telling you, they would have had to have had a cell phone. Because there's no other way you could get to tell me if you're not. Like tomorrow, I went and said, foot if you not coming, I gone. You know. Maybe the fear was so perplexing that he couldn't even move him after catch up. You know. And the angel brings an assurance. He says to him, Don't be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. No. Let me read some more. So we put it in context for you. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no water or liquor. He will drink skip 14. You skip 14. no wine, sorry. Oh, you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. So this youth will bring great joy. Sorry, Miss verse 14. Mm -hmm. and because I'm so rushing to get to 15 for feeding. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine. Mr. Amir, or liquor. Uh, well, for all of the those, you know. Um, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Now, understand what filling in the Spirit is. What does filling in the Spirit mean, according to Ephesians? Controlled. It don't mean that in when up with the Holy Spirit till it reach right here, sir. He's not a reservoir. But from his, in his mother's womb, he will be controlled by the Holy Spirit. It's the same thing Ephesians says. Be ye, don't be filled with wine. Notice wine, come back here, sir. And spirit, same thing Ephesians says. But be ye what? Filled with the Spirit. Means to be under the control of the Holy Spirit. In our case, it requires a submission. In his case, he's controlled. God takes a hold of him. From when? In his mother's womb. So, this certainly is a child of God. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. What was his message again? Repent. repent. The, kingdom of the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What repent means again? Sorry. Turn back or away from, rather. Turn away from. Stop with your sins. Stop with your disobedience. Stop walking in the ways that are not pleasing to God. Start being obedient to God. To turn away from don't mean you just turn around and stand up. But you start walking in the other way. Repentance don't mean to just stop. It means to start doing what is right. Hello? We better pack up because some people outside get vexed and before anything starts true. You know? That's what it means. He will turn them back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go up as the forerunner before him. Who is him? Jesus. Now what is a forerunner? A forerunner was somebody who would come before the king. And as the king is driving through the city, he would run ahead and he would say, On your knees, the king is coming. On your knees, the king is coming. He proclaims the arrival of the king. And here he is proclaiming, and he's going to be the one to proclaim that Jesus is coming. And he does. He does. So much so that when Jesus reached, he announces him. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. 
after horror. And he will go out and before him in the spirit and in the power of Elijah. No, it is not Elijah's power because Elijah had no power in and of himself. So to be in the spirit and the power of Elijah is means to be walking in the same manner that Elijah walked and is to be empowered in the same way that Elijah was empowered. So don't bother come now and talk about Lord I claim in the spirit and the power of Elijah. Please. See? Why is he given that? Not so that he can show off and tell people I'm full of power. But to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous. So as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. I'm not going to even attempt to finish it. We're going to finish it next week. Make sure you're coming. We'll stop it here. It's one purpose was to get people aligned to God. Israel was completely out of alignment. I don't know if you ever drive a car that need alignment yet. Me and Maureen was driving cars that needed alignment recently. Wanted parts. And here's how alignment goes. You hear some sound under the front that boy, you're not even sure if you're going to reach where you're going. And then you go in so on the car go on going so. Yeah? It destroys the car. Oh, we're not even going to mention what it destroys, you know, because they're not giving any offering. So don't worry, so don't worry, worry. <laughs> but but you know, it it, to, to, it means that the car is not tracking like you are steering. Israel is completely out of alignment. There are some of us who are not aligned to God's will or purpose. Let me just tell you that. Let me just stop right here and say that to you. There are too many of us that are running like a car that needs alignment. We are not aligned to God's will or purpose like all these were. And we need to find ourselves back there so that God can carry out his work in us. Because of Israel's failure, later on we will see that Messiah rejected Israel. Or didn't reject them, but postponed his, his, his work. Why? They rejected him. They were not aligned to his purpose. They didn't line up with his will. They weren't interested in doing what thus says God. You know what's amazing? All them people get up about them as prophet and talk about thus says God and I'm not even walking in obedience to God. Do you bother with the thus says God? For? There is a requirement, my friends, online and otherwise, that too many of us not meeting there is a problem with the church in that the church is not reflecting what we see written about these people, that they were righteous. Because of faith, they are made righteous. We too are made righteous on account of faith. But we don't meet the next line. And they were walked. We're not walking. We're struggling. And the thing we struggle with is obedience. And guess what? What it really boils down to. Here's what disobedience boils down to. You don't love God enough. Full stop. No argument. You could have talked from now till next week. It's not changing anything. It will not change anything. You are disobedient to God because you don't love him. You can't say that. Really? Really? My sheep 
hear my voice, and they know me, and they what? Follow me. To disobey God is to reject him as your shepherd. And there is this word. Don't know it man, it finds itself in the church, but it's a big word in the church these days. Compromise. There's no compromise here. Read the story. They wanted a child more than anything else. They suffered the effects of not having a child. They were ridiculed. They felt bad. They were treated in the worst way. Their own rabbis taught them that God had rejected them. Even though it's not true. Here they are. But it didn't cause them not to walk. What's your struggle? What's your struggle? Because for every time we are in disobedience to God, it is one simple reason. There is something that we have higher than him. You know, that's what I don't like about him, you know. That's why they don't want to come Bible study. Because him just have a way to say things. And, you know, him, 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 I mean, oh, him reach there, so. Well, listen to me. The Bible says no man can have two masters. So if you're being one, is that one you love more than the other one? The Bible says so, not me. So if I am doing something, when God says do this, then I am loving that master more than I am loving God. Hello. This is a new year. And I'm not one to talk about um, what I'm calling it, what I'm doing every new year. Resolution. I should have been resolute, and you should have been resolute long ago to serve God and to be obedient to Him. It's, it's no, that don't need no new year. That is the call of God on our lives. And then it is manifested not only in our walk, but in our serve. Look at where Zachariah was. He was doing the work of the Lord, serving in the temple the same way. You know, how I many of us not serving God? Just full of chat. Just full of chat. Can't get you to do anything. Always have the biggest chat. Always have the most criticism. Always have something to say. But you're not involved. You're not walking. Your gift not being exercised. Remember I tell you? Just the other day before we close off. People who have a gift that is not being manifested in the church. And you are given a gift for the greater glory of God. And for the edification and the building up of the church. And if you're not walking in your gift. You are robbing me and all the others around you from being mature. Hello. Our theme this year, at the beginning of the year, is contending for the faith. I know like what I tell you, half of you are going missing Sunday. We're getting up Friday, we don't want no more pastor. That's our theme. Because we need to rise up. Thank you for joining us. We are so happy that you came. It's our first day. We are two minutes over, but we're two minutes late when we started. God bless you. We look forward to see you on Sunday morning at 8 o'clock and at 10 o'clock. Please set your watches, set your alarms, and set the time so that you don't reach like all some people just reaching. <laughs> God bless you. Have a great week. And we see you on Sunday. Thank you.